Welcome to Malcolm Reed's How to Barbecue Right, a podcast where we talk about barbecue, share recipes, and discuss all things delicious. And now, here's your host, Malcolm and Rochelle Reed. Hey, welcome back to How to Barbecue Right podcast. I'm your host, Malcolm Reed, joined by my lovely wife, Miss Southern Shell. We got Tyler still out, so we got Jacob over on the board with us. What's going on, Shell? Not much. It's been a busy couple weeks, Mal. It has. We did a bunch of cooking last week at the new smokehouse with Ethan from Grilla Grills. We went back and did a little bit. Yeah, did some more this week. And I guess uh, you'd say that was our first official video. Yeah, I guess it was. When, uh, this week. When, uh, this week's was? Yeah, when we, what we filmed yeah, this week. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's been busy. Just trying to get everything situated. You know, it's there's like a lot you, more stuff to move and set up than you think there would be when yeah. you're trying to... Get ready to do some filming. And it's like, uh, do we have cooking spray out here? No. <laughs> it's uh, we. What'd you say? Start a list. <laughs> yeah. Every time you need something, write it down. That, that's what we're doing. Because we're like out there. We're 20, 25 minutes from a store to get. You know, I, mean, I guess there's a Dollar General on the way, but <laughs> it's not the best. Yeah, of the Dollar yeah, if you're down to that for supply, <laughs> I mean, it works at Deer Camp. Yeah, it's, it's tough when you're trying to get video content. They got veiny sausages. They do have. They have good veiny sausages. Do you feel like summer kind of throws you off your game? Uh, not off my game. It's. I mean, I just. I get used to getting ready for that summer vacation break. Yeah. You know, I'm ready to go to the beach. I'm ready to go fishing. <laughs> I'm ready to do all this other fun stuff. And you know, of course, we go got the holidays. We're cooking go. around and stuff. But for the most part, I'm like, yeah, let's do just quick grill stuff and let's. You know, because we still grill out and we eat for dinner instead of yeah. the week and stuff, but it's usually fast stuff, like the long cooks and doing all the – everything else. I don't do a whole lot of that just around the holidays during the summer. The rest of the time, it's – This week, uh, you cooked on a griddle. You cooked dinner on a griddle. Yeah, man. I'm t- I've am been on I've been on that boneless thigh kick, boneless skinless thighs, however you can cook them. But I did something for the first Which time. Is, you used to hate it. You would make fun of me for cooking boneless skinless sauce. Yeah, I did, except for barnet's chicken on the Weber. Yeah, that was the yeah, way yeah. that I've always liked them. But there's, I mean, there's so many ways. I mean, you know, it's the thigh yeah, is the thigh. Them. It's delicious on its own. But you can season them, marinate them, use different sauces, cook them different ways, from the air fryer to the flat top to the grill. You've even been doing them on the pellet grill. And that was one thing. So was it last week? When did we go to Arkansas? It was, it was before Grilla Grills came in. We ran over to Arkansas to do a little trout fishing and see see our friends over there at Townsend Spice and hang out. And Shell coming off her her little girls trip where y'all pre cooked stuff and took it to make meals. You said we were going to do that because it turned out so good. And so I said, "What's actually we one do? of my topics?" For oh, today. was it really? Yeah. <laughs> so we're using boneless skinless thighs, and and you can make man we made tacos with them and at the, at the river, but. Yeah. This week, I was like, for Father's Day, I forget what we had we had done, and we'd we'd had some pork butt last week, so we'd had barbecue throughout the week, left over, and some smoke sauce stuff like that. We did with the grilling guy. We did everything. We did some ribs. We did we did barbecue. We did wings. We did I forget what all I did. Little I did little bacon wrap thigh bites. And you asked me what I wanted for Father's Day. You you cooked me a steak. I feel like oh. you're getting way off topic. But I just <laughs> I want to talk about what I did with this. So I said I wanted. Some lo mein. And yeah. our favorite Chinese place here in town was closed because the storms came through. Yeah. And I couldn't get my lo mein from Mr. Chin's. And so Monday we went down to the farm and you said, what are we going to do? And I said, let's make lo mein on the flat top. So. And I was like, I don't know about this, man. Yeah. I've never done this before. I said, what I say? Trust me. Don't worry about it. It'll be great. <laughs> so we went to the store and we got some zucchini, some onion, uh, bell pepper, uh, mushroom, yellow yeah, squash. yellow squash. I bought some boneless, skinless thighs, and then we just got some linguine noodles. And that's the noodles we chose to use, just a flat noodle. And you got a um, a stir fry sauce stir- instead of making your own. Cause, it was just you know. kinkle mine, just yeah. whatever stir fry sauce I saw. And you got a marinade. Yeah, it was like a, it was a, I think it was just Kroger brand teriyaki style marinade, sauce and marinade is what it said on the bottle, basic label. And I took those thighs and layered them in like this Tupperware container and poured that marinade over as I layered them and let them soak in the refrigerator for like three and a half hours. And so I, the only pre did, I cut up the vegetables and then you cooked the pasta. It was just like, what, 11 minutes of yeah, water? Yeah, I actually cooked it a little under. Yeah. 
because I knew we were going to. And then you drained it and chilled it, let it get cold. Yeah. Because you won't cook pasta for the flat top, or at least that was what I was thinking. I guess that's how they do it in the Chinese restaurants, too. Yeah. It's already boiled, and then they toss it in the sauce. And that's what we're basically doing. And I will say this about the noodles if you just cook noodles, let them drain and let them sit in the strainer and get all hot, they'll turn into like a a, a lump. One glob. <laughs> one, they will be at one noodle. So what did you do? So you, um, I actually Googled it to figure out what was the best way to do it. Because I knew it would happen, you know, because I've yeah. done noodles before. Um, yeah, essentially you just shock them. I, I took the same pan that I boiled them in and, you know, got it cold, put some ice water in it and put the strainer down in there and basically cooled the noodles completely and tossed them a little bit yeah. as I was Because they stayed perfect. Yeah. It really made a big difference. Yeah. So what I did was fired up that old Weber griddle and took them took the chicken out of the marinade and I put it on a platter with just like some paper towel to kind of get some of the excess off. So I didn't want it just super marinated going right on the flat top, put down a little bit of oil threw those thighs on there and just started cooking them. And man, they charred up. That's the first time I've ever done those on there, but not sliced either whole boneless skinless, just like they come out of the package trimmed a little bit, but they cooked and got a sauce on them. I seasoned them. The only thing I seasoned them with was a little TX for some salt and pepper. And I moved them over to the side of the flat top. And they've got this, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but is it Bacanes or Bakken's Japanese barbecue sauce? Yeah, yeah. You yeah. see it now in grocery stores. And it came out just a few years ago, but it's, it's in a the white squeeze label. bottle. Yeah. And then it's got a red top and there's another one with a green top. So I squeezed that over the top of them as I had them over on the low side of the flat top, just hanging out. And it started just sizzling and caramelizing. And then we cooked the vegetables. Like you put the zucchini and the yellow squash over on one side, peppers and onions in the middle on high heat because they needed to, they needed to get salt. And mushrooms. And mushrooms. Yeah. yeah the main mushrooms. Once the vegetables got done, I ran inside with the chicken, sliced them across ways and then across the grain into little strips, brought the noodles back outside, threw them on the flat top, hit them with some of that uh, oil, noodles down, Poured the stir fry sauce all over them, combined the, the the vegetables, added the chicken over, and you've got a griddle full of <laughs> I guess if you call it chicken vegetable lo mein. Yeah. Man, phenomenal. It was really good. I'm talking about discovered something new. <laughs> it was so good. Discovered something I mean, new. <laughs> from new to me. Discovered something new to me. It was good. You don't need thing. a walk. You can do it right there, yeah. hibachi style. I guess that's a cross between like Chinese, Japanese. We fusioned it up. <laughs> Michael even loved it. Oh, yeah. He thought it was great. Yeah. He, uh, there were some of the vegetables. He's like, oh, I'm not eating those like that. I don't like them like that. But the yeah. chicken, the chicken and the vegetables, like if you wanted to omit the noodles, yeah. you could just do stir fry basically vegetables and chicken and it, it'll blow people away. It was so good. It was very good. Uh, and, it, and you bought some fortune cookies. We had fortune <laughs> yeah, cookies. Yeah, what did you say? Don't worry about your future. I, I, like, <laughs> I don't It was like something that like that, all. wasn't it? Yeah. Should you not. no longer have to worry about your future or something. So I'm, just, I'm pretty sure I do. I, does I that mean you're worrying. about to <laughs> yeah. croak or does it? Uh, to me, there's only one way not to worry about your future. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're no longer have no, one. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you're off the new beginning somewhere else. Dude, that went away. Yeah, did you? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we now have a sugar-free sauce available. We do. Killer Hog Zero Sugar. Zero Sugar Sauce. And it's dang good. It is pretty good. See, I was, I've was i been trying to watch my, you know, sugar content, stuff yeah. like that. So back off on some stuff where you can. I can't do it on everything. But um, it got me to thinking. I was buying, I don't, what's the brand I buy? It's got the guy on the front of it. Yeah, I can never remember the name of it, but it was one of the, I saw it on TikTok, so I saw it at Walmart and bought it, and it's okay, but most of those zero sugar. G. Hughes. Yeah, G. Hughes. He's got a line of no sugar sauces, and they're, they'll do. They're okay. You don't, don't really like, like it, because you can taste the aspartame or whatever it is they're sweetening it with. You, It's like drinking a zero sugar Pepsi or something. You can taste it. In those sauces, and I wanted to make it's one aftertaste. So I wanted to make one that you couldn't. So I talked to my bottler, and they sent me some samples of some different sugar substitutes, and I wanted to base it off kind of a combo, my vinegar and my regular sauce, but I didn't want it to taste like 
that fake sweetener. And so that's that's what I came up with. Um, we use we use that, and it's um, it's not zero calories because you do get some calories from the tomato paste, but there's no sugar added, so it's zero sugar. Like on the label, there's no sugar in it, you know. And that, so that's um, and this took you a while to kind of. Oh yeah, it was. It was because a, a lot of it, a lot of it tastes tasted fake or yeah. like Splenda or Sweet and Low or something like that, and I did not, you know, I didn't want that. I wanted that vinegar sauce taste, and I think that's what helps is that combo of the vinegar sauce because the vinegar must mask it or tone it down to where you don't taste the the the, yeah. the fake sugar. Yeah, it just tastes like barbecue sauce. And I've had some people tell me this is better than the regular sauce. Like they want to use that. You can just about market it or put it on there just a new barbecue sauce and not even tell folks it's locale, but it is. So if you're looking for a substitute or you you know you're concerned about corn syrup or stuff like that in yeah. your sauces because i mean that's what to get them to where you can even afford to make them you have to use some kind of you know sugar or corn syrup or something that's in most stuff and these have none of it yeah none of the junk <clears throat> it's really good well yeah we've been trying to i gotta do recipes with it i ain't done a, i hadn't yeah, filled any recipes with it it's brand new like we just we had some samples at memphis and may that we kind of put out and let people try and got some feedback on and then it came, like, we ordered it, and it, would it come in a week or so ago? It hadn't been live long on the website. Yeah. And I think that it's getting, some wholesale people are getting it. Like, you'll see it in some stores, but I don't know how many. It's not going, like, mass market right now. So if you want yeah. to try it, you can get it from us. Is it going to be on Amazon? Eventually. Eventually. I don't think it is. Right yet. now, yeah. we just have it on the website. What sucks, <laughs> what sucks about zero sugar stuff, and this is across the board, when you go to trying to make a healthier product or even buying fresh produce, it's more expensive. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's just the cost of those ingredients cost more. You can't make it for the same. Well, corn syrup is Dirt cheap. cheap. Yeah. yeah. All that fake, all, all that. Fake stuff yeah. is cheap. All that sugar stuff's cheap. That's where they got you, Shell. <laughs> they want to keep you unhealthy and eating the, eating the junk food. I mean, I love and it. I, do I love, love it. Food. I love it with the best of them. <laughs> yeah. So Cheetos is good. But now you have something you can, you know, yeah, use with your That's chicken right. breast. You can. Broccoli. That's no joke. Um, I cooked a ribeye steak for you for Father's Day. So good. Like I brought it up so you could brag about how good it I, was. <laughs> so we went to Como Steakhouse last week with the grill yeah, guys yeah. when they come. We wanted to give them a taste of Mississippi, take them to an old traditional steakhouse. And I got the ribeye there, and it was it was good. It was what I expected. You go there, you're going to get your baked potato loaded. You're going to get your salad with ranch. Mm-hmm. You're going to get your steak. And it's delicious. But there's something about one cooked at home that can, you know, blow a restaurant. Steak. If somebody oh, knows yeah. what they're doing, they can cook a steak yeah. way better than a restaurant, and you can cook a steak way better than a restaurant. Especially, I didn't cook it. Yeah, that so makes it so much better. It, it really does. Like, when I cook one, I mean, yeah, they're great. It's a great steak, but I don't enjoy it as much. Because you've been over the grill, you smelled all of it. It doesn't taste the same. If you if you let someone else cook it, and you get to sit down and it's like they put it in front of you, it's like man, that's a, that's better than my steak. <laughs> I don't know how you did it. I honestly don't. And those were just Walmart though. steaks. They were Walmart meats. I don't know if it's the Walmart in our area, but some of their steaks have been hitting. Yeah. Because I bought us two ribeyes and I bought Michael's strip. And the strip looked as good as the ribeyes. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Was that which was that the Black Angus brand at Walmart or label or whatever? I didn't. Pay attention. I just dug through till I found the ribeyes yeah. that looked the best because I want the spinalis. I want the marbling. So we had what was asparagus and baked potatoes and mushrooms with it, mm-hmm. and they were all that's like ultimate Father's Day meal to me. After that, you. I wanted lo mein. <laughs> so what else can I have that's bad for me? That really wasn't. I guess the sauces that I used was the bad part about it. The lo mein, yeah, yeah, that was the bad part, and the noodles, I guess. Yeah, there's a lot of carbs in that. But we could have done a lot less noodles or even done the pro. I like the noodles. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good. Um, so lately you've received a couple pro- uh, really cool promo packs. I have the bounty. I got a bounty promo pack. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. That one. Uh, sent me some paper towels. I use them every day. <laughs> use them that every day. That was a great pack. Yeah. A lot of times you end up with some. Something you ain't going to use. Yeah. A, one of those cheap girl yeah. sets and an apron. 
No, but the bounty, they sent us paper towels and coupons. And an apron. For free coupons. Oh, did we get coupons for free paper towels? Yeah. Shout out to Bounty. I'm you, using those like I used them yesterday. Oh, they, yeah, they sent you a... a quicker picker upper. Is that how you say it? <laughs> The quicker picker upper. They sent you a, a paper towel holder, too. So. Yeah, which one came with the that Japanese sauce we use? That was, that was the hex clad. Okay. So you got probably the, that was probably the coolest promo pack you've ever gotten. The hex it was the hex clad. It was like a pot, a skillet, and a grill pan, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. And Dude. you got a Gordon Ramsay cookbook and Yeah, yeah. A Gordon Ramsay cookbook and a bottle of that Bacanes, wasn't it? Yeah. Man, those hex clads are bad to the bone. So I wanted to talk to you They're about the hex clads. <laughs> Gordon Ramsay calls them the roll roll Rolls Royce. I'll help you with that. <laughs> Just of think pans. of Lambert's rolls. <laughs> rolls, rolls Royce. Royce of pans. I don't know if I'll go that far. <laughs> I mean, I've never been to Rolls, never even seen one in person, I don't think. So. Yeah. But they are mighty good pans. So what do you know about them? I know to, that. Uh, I've seen a lot of stuff. So it's basically a nonstick pan that has stainless steel hexagons in it to prevent you from scratch. You know how stainless steel, like you're only supposed to use like silicone or uh, wooden spoons yeah. because you can scratch that Teflon coating in some of them. And over time it wears off. And those pans, they say they're only good for like five or six years. Is a lot. And I've, Two to I've five got, is what shoot, I've seen. I've got some 20-something years old, still <laughs> scratched up, used them every day. But it's supposed to cook a lot like, I guess it's kind of a hybrid between a, cooking in a stainless pan or cooking – you know, in nonstick, yeah. they wash up easy. That's a big selling point to them. Uh, food's not supposed, it's supposed to like the ridges help you brown food more even because you have a little more surface areas to touch it. So if you're trying to brown up chicken thighs or, you know, cook bacon in a pan or something like that, that you can do it. Now, what I have saw is like, say if you're cooking a fried egg in it, most of the time a fried egg will cook with limited oil in a nonstick pan. But since this one has those little stainless edges, you have to use like oil or butter or something yeah. when you're frying an egg. But from what I've seen, I've fried an egg in it, and it does fine. I don't just fry it up naked. I always put a little butter or something there. Um, Cleanup's easy, though. It just wipes right out. You don't have to deglaze it. Like, you know, my stainless pans, we have a set of those at home we use all the time. But when you're cooking those, usually you have to – Put a little water in it, deglaze that pan at the end when you've cooked something, you know, and that's, yeah. that's just how I do it. It's the easiest way to get them to come clean. Yeah. And, um, you know, they fairly wipe out. You don't really have to soak them, but you don't have to scrub them. I mean, sometimes you have to scrub them a little. These, the hex clad, I don't think you do. Whatever. It's supposed to be lifetime. Like well, lifetime warranty. Do you believe it? No. I mean, you believe they'll scratch? No, let us get a hold of them. Yeah. We'll put it to the test. Um. What I read about it, it, it basically, like, they took the best parts of all the cooking. Like, the aluminum is the... Yeah. You, do you realize it's aluminum in the middle? I didn't know what it was. Yeah. I no clue. Aluminum in the middle, so it's... Aluminum core is what they call it, so it heats up fast. Yeah, I did see that. They're supposed to heat up evenly, too. Yeah. And then you got a magnetic steel base that's good for induction or going in the Oh, oven. well, they go on, like, yeah. induction top? See, I yeah. haven't tried that. And I use that all the time when I'm doing videos. Because a lot of times yeah. I want my eye... Right there on the countertop, and so we bought. I ordered one of those uh, induction eyes off Amazon, but I'm always having to use cast iron or something that basically a magnet will stick to. Like a lot of my stuff won't, you know. Like you can't yeah. just cook on stainless with it. And it takes forever to get it hot. Yeah. I wonder if this would get hotter faster I, that's because a good it's got question. the aluminum yeah. core. Um, and then it's got. It says it has nonstick valleys and the hexagon steel ridges. Yeah. So it's steel ridges and then the nonstick. That's where the yeah, nonstick is, yeah, the Teflon, I guess, part. Yeah. So, I f and then a stainless steel surface. Um, so I feel like they took all the best parts of pans and yeah, smushed them into one. Does that mean it's going to be better? I don't know. The jury's out. I ain't cooked on it enough. Yeah. Just from what I've used, it works fine. I don't know if it's the worth the price tag. What is the price tag? I think the set's like. Over a grand. Are you serious? Like you buy a, oh yeah, Ooh. well over, I think. Hold on, let me look. They're not cheap. Now they may run specials and you see it, but they do look cool. They do look cool. And they feel like heavy duty, you know, nice. Oh yeah. They're running two hundred dollars a pan. Yeah. If you buy them individually. Ooh. Pretty high. It's not the old Caflon or whatever that you can get. 
It comes with a nice bag, so you can store them properly. <laughs> in a bag? Oh, no. <laughs> Throw them in the dead gum drawer. <laughs> That's what you do with those. So, uh, and you're supposed to season them. It says. I didn't season mine. <laughs> Did you read the instructions? Rinse that dude. No, it's a pan. I rinsed that dude out and threw it on the eye and went to cooking. I mean, who needs an instruction for a pan? <laughs> huh? Not you. Not me. I've been cooking since I could walk. So you, the jury's still out on them. You don't know if they're worth the money. I mean, they're good pans. I ain't going to lie. Yeah. They're good pans. It's a heavy duty. feels good. feels like a fancy pan. They look really cool. And I was just excited that you. That was the cool. I can't afford to set up right now. I got a piece, one piece at a time. At what? I'm gonna only that one. So now you want to talk about um, grilling on vacation? Yeah, I, I tried to grill in a dugum storm. We were down. Yeah. We were on the river, and we we had been where have we been that day up the creek and out on the beach there, and in the storms we could see the storm coming. It was a few miles away, and we said, oh, "We better get on this boat and get out of here." So we jetted back. Got back to the cabin, and it was we were cooking. We were staying. We were keeping it easy that night, just doing some burgers, wasn't it, on the grill? Yeah. And I was like, I'm gonna go ahead and fire the grill up. They had a pretty decent, heavy duty grill anyway at the cabin we were staying in. So I pulled it right off the porch and fired it up. And uh, next thing you know, uh, I don't know. I thought it was a big tornado. Honestly, I was scared. But uh, it was it was the wind. It was like a major major gust. Of wind coming up the, we we're kind of like up on a cliff over the river, and when that wind blew across, I thought it was going to turn that grill over. It was knocking stuff off the porch. Oh, it blew everything off the porch. Yeah, he said well, when you called to talk to the guy we rented the cabin from, he said I got a real nice grill. Yeah, real nice. Tr- what do you call it? A, tr- uh, a barbecue. barbecue. You got a real nice, a real barbecue. nice barbecue. It was heavy duty. <laughs> it was twenty years old. Well, the problem <laughs> with it was it had like an inch and a half exhaust. So you could not get it to draw. You had to cook with the lid propped open to get the air to flow through it. Once you did that, I just got me a spatula and <laughs> jimmied it up to where it'd, it'd draw. Then it would cook. But I would hate it. I had to like cook ribs or something. Yeah. I mean, it would have been a fight. It had one of those different levels where you could raise the grate, the fire grate up and down and get it close to the food or whatever. But, I mean, it was heavy duty, but as far as the way it cooked, it needed some modification. So, but every time you go on vacation, you're always kind of working with whatever you got. What you got to, you got to work with what you got. You can cook on anything. I'm a firm believer in that. As long as you can get the airflow right. But we turned it out. We did some did hamburgers one night. What did I do the other night? Steaks. Brats. Brat. Yeah, we did brats. brats. And, dogs. Yeah. and we did cook steaks, but we cooked them on somebody else's grill. Yeah, hasty bake. Yeah. Lawson brought his hasty bake over and cooked steaks. Those are good steaks too. Talk real quick about that hasty bake. That was pretty cool. It was real cool. Um, hasty, you know, hasty bakes have been around for a while. They're really big, in the SCA circuit right now. I actually bought Michael one last year, the tabletop model. I forget which model it's called. It's one that's a little, yeah, small box. But that's Lawson had one. I bet you could cook a dozen steaks on it at a time. And of course, it has the grill functions: the lower the grate and get them where you want. The lid's huge; you can put on it, put grill grates on half of it and have half of it over for, you know, just two zoning or whatever. It was a pretty cool grill. Plus, I mean, he put it out. We just set it back in the back of a side by side and took it right back to his house. It wasn't no problem moving it around. It wasn't that heavy. It wasn't that bad. Yeah, no, I mean, it was a two man lift job, but it wasn't bad. But it holds more space than like a oh PK? yeah 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 yeah. It's, really? it's bigger than like a Weber or a PK. I mean, the grade on it's pretty good size. I don't know exact measurements, but it was pretty good size. Um, instead of bringing a charcoal and uh tumbleweeds and a lighter and and a <laughs> chimney we just bought some match light we did it smells so good you tell me how come barbecue don't smell like this when you cook it because <laughs> it's, like, it's lighter fluid shell that's all you're smelling is lighter fluid but it so smells- it tastes like a kid i guess like you had old diz and a bottle of <laughs> of uh lighter fluid squeezed all over it and let it burn 30 minutes it smells so good i walked outside i was like what did it remind you of like I guess summertime, childhood, yeah. Childhood summertime. That's what it reminds me. My dad always used lighter fluid. Yeah. Soaked it down and got it going. <laughs> it just smelled so good. It did not smell good. You it did even smell said... good. It did smell good. My problem with it is you got to let it burn off or you're going to get that taste in yeah. your food. And then those coals burn up so fast, they don't, you know, they don't stay heated long. You can't add any more coal to it. 
you'd have to burn them off and add them, you know, hot because if you, if they weren't burned off properly, you're gonna get that chemical smell. There's a place for it, you know. Camping's a great place to use something like that. Cut down on what you have to bring. Yeah, we just brought two little bitty bags of match light. Yeah, but I'm a, you know, I'm a roll up briquette, get them going in the chimney, and have everything you need to get a proper fire going. But when you're going on it vacation, works to cook burgers and brats. It's simple. Have you ever it's used simple. one of those uh, campsite grills? Yeah, heck yeah, I have. You know the 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 bird latrine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you got to make sure you burn them off and clean them good. You don't know what's been on there, but I've used them. Usually, we'd take a aluminum full and line it all over yeah. it, and then clean that great, get that great good and hot, scrub it off, and I figure go what, to cooking. You can do a lot of modifications with aluminum full on one of those things. You can make you a lid for it. I've done all kinds of stuff on those. I've always said I was going to put one out in the yard because I just think it'd make a cool talking point to have. What is that? What do you got that out there for? That's my, that's my grill. <laughs> it's like cement it in. A like, rusty yeah. old. Yeah, park grill. <laughs> Don't you think that'd be cool? It's basically just uh put you some old stumps around it and just have you a little that's that's your outdoor cooking area. I could see using it. I would I mean it's a, I've cooked a many a red hot dogs on one. I imagine once you get that uh grate up to five hundred degrees. It'll it's kill gonna, anything. Yeah, kill yeah anything. that's what Andy Cap told me that. <laughs> what? It'll kill anything. Get it hot enough. Get it hot enough. Don't matter what Coons or birds or whatever's been on it. <laughs> <laughs> Everything stops at the park grill. I mean, it's like the high point. So they get a vantage point up there. Yeah. So there's no telling what kind of Yeah, and you know food stuff's left over it. So oh. it's drawing all the critters too. So they're not the most sanitized things. That's why you can build a build a big fire in them. That's what you need the match light for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get going. Burn it off. That's the whole thing. It's like the pre Oven clean cycle for one of those is just a bag of match light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then go get your other charcoal and really go to cooking. It's good to go, yeah. No, but uh, one thing that we've been doing lately is vacation food prep. Yeah. You and like you, it because you don't have to go out and eat when we go places. Sometimes it's hard to go out and eat in, on vacation. In the middle of nowhere it is. Yeah. yeah. Or sometimes when you've got a bunch, a bunch of people. Of kids, bunch of screaming kids. A bunch of screaming kids. You don't want to wait two hours <laughs> to go get a piece yeah, of fish that's right. on the beach. But what did you think about it when I? Oh, I thought it was excellent. See, I thought it was excellent. It was easy. The the chicken we did was just as good. Warm back up. I mean, it was it was easy. I make a whole Super menu, easy. like what we're gonna have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It is planned. If you got you somebody that's OCD will plan everything out <laughs> like that, it's great. Because you know, I just showed up here with bologna. Here's bread. We might do burgers. We might have to go find some meat and some buns and. That's my planning. I know. And then we end up spending all afternoon driving around looking for buns. Yeah, but it's fun. You get to, <laughs> you get to go to town. Yeah. You get to see the local places. I go to the beach. I like going to Rouse's. It's one of my favorite yeah, stores yeah. down there. They got a Publix. I don't ever get to go to a Publix. I don't want to go to a grocery store on my vacation. <laughs> yeah, you hate that. That's usually my first stop. We got to go to the grocery store. <laughs> Walk down the aisle, see what they got. Why do you like grocery stores so much? I don't know. As a kid, I was the kid that was wanted to be up under the buggy riding and going up and down the aisles with my grandparents or my parents. I mean, that was what we did. Did y'all not do that? I hated every minute of it. You hated going to the grocery store? I hated going to the grocery store. Grocery stores used to have a toy aisle, too. I don't even know yeah. if they do anymore, do they? I haven't been on a toy aisle Our in so Kirker long. Does. Man, that's where you'd always, if, if you lost a kid, that's where you went <laughs> to get them. On the toy aisle at the grocery store or Walmart. But, yeah, I don't know. I like I like going and seeing what's in stores and finding stuff. Yeah, and looking at their meats, meat yeah, department. Yeah, looking at their meats. That's usually I spend a lot of time there, seasoning all. And their deli and their bakery, yeah. just checking it all oh, out. Oh, like the Rouse's down at Gulf Shores? Man, they cook some of the best food. You can get a full Thanksgiving dinner there. I mean, they've got I mean, fresh boiled crawfish and shrimp and they got some of the best king cakes, too. Yeah. Their bakery makes really good king cakes. If y'all are in that area, I highly suggest going to a Rouse's. They redid so. the one in Orange Beach, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. It's real new and nice. I did go in it. It was under construction last time I was there. Yeah. I was like, when are they going to finish this? But when we went on vacation, I did a fettuccine Alfredo, cooked it, vacuum put it in a pan, vacuum sealed it. How did that do, reheating? It did really well. Was it not dry or? I made sure it was real like saucy. Okay. Before I 
vacuum sealed it because, and I was like, this is going to be way too uh, oversauced. Yeah. Is what I thought. But by the time I got it there and it be- reheated it, it was like perfect. Was it, it better than like Stouffer's or yeah. something like that? Yeah. yeah. I think so. That's what I mean. It's really a great idea. Yeah. And then we did uh, tacos. I pre cooked the taco meat and. Oh, you had to just warm it up? Did you warm yeah. it up in a pan? Or yeah, I just threw it in a pan. I did some chicken, some grilled chicken, and some uh, just ground beef. We did kind of the same thing, but you did steak. We did yeah, chicken and steak I did when we went. Skirt to the, steak. Yeah. It did. Man, it was fantastic. See? You vacuum seal it, and I warmed it back up in the bag. Oh, did and, you? Yeah, I didn't dump it out in the pan. I didn't want to overcook it because I'd had it just yeah. the right temps. I just wanted to get it back to serving temp without, um, you know, because I like, I like my skirt steak on that medium side, you know, medium rare to medium. And if you heat it up back in the pan, it's going to go to well done quick on you and be all gray looking. Yeah. So I kept it to where it still had that look just by warming it, keeping it in that bag and bringing it up slow. How'd you bring it up slow? Warmed up some water and just had it sitting there in a the pot, just kind of almost like a sous vide. And oh. I just did it for a few, dropped it down in it and pulled it back out and dropped it down in it and just kept checking it until it was the bag kind of blows up a little. Okay. I was like, oh, that's good and hot. Then, then I took it out, put it in a cooler to take it over to the other cabin, and it kind of sucked back down. And it was, when I busted it open, I mean, it smelled just like you took it off the grill and cut it up. And it, you did, it wasn't overcooked at that point? No, not at all. Not at all. It was good. I feel like this would be a good time to talk about blue plate mayonnaise. Because uh, you'd use that, that chicken salad you did. <laughs> yeah, I did a, I pre did a chicken salad, yep, too. Yep. It was Roast some chickens and then pull them up. Well, that was – so you forgot something in that chicken salad. We didn't have enough of something. Eggs. Was it eggs? Yeah. So you only had like two two boiled eggs? Yeah, and a big – It salad. made – like it was simple potato salad, but it was – Chicken salad. Yeah. Chicken salad, but, man, it was so good. I think what made it was a jar of the sweet fire pickles. Not chopped. You just dumped the whole jar in there and mixed it up. But, man, it was, you know – I didn't feel like chopping it up. I was tired. I'd been. It, we're, it was late. I was like, "We're just gonna dump them in their hole." You vacuum sealed that? No, you didn't vacuum seal that. That just went in like a Tupperware. Didn't I it? did vacuum seal that. Oh, the uh, and then you vacuum sealed the pasta salad too. And I was like, "There is no way this pasta salad is gonna be good this weekend because it had tomatoes in it, like fresh tomatoes, and it had olives and all the stuff that goes in a pasta salad." It was a good with pasta. the man with blue plate. Yeah, and it was like a creamy pasta salad, which is great when you first make it. But I was like, this is fixing to turn into pink mush. Because <laughs> I did. never, yeah, because I was like, you put that in a bowl and try to take it and eat it two, for two or three days, because it was a big pasta salad. But this is not going to be good at all. And we didn't eat it till like that second, third day. And you vacuum sealed it. And it was just as good. I think, I guess it's the vacuum sealing. Yeah, it didn't, the tomatoes didn't make it all pink. And there wasn't stuff, like juice yeah. and stuff. And I guess it didn't have room to juice or something. I don't know. But I was expecting them to be mushy and nasty. Like, I don't like, Day or two old cut up tomatoes, they're just not good. But I guess taking the air off of them changed it, or it preserved it enough. And it wasn't going to be good for a week, probably. Yeah. But to do that, like if you got to go somewhere, you could definitely vacuum seal p- pasta salad, and it works. Yeah. If you're going on vacation and don't want to have to go out to eat every night, I say meal prep it. Yeah. Vacuum seal it. Throw it in the freezer cooler. I like it because you can pack it in the cooler and put your ice on bottom and then lay the plastic things on. And it's like a refrigerator by the time you layer your ice and stuff. Mm-hmm. Everything doesn't get all wet. That's kind of what we did. We left the big cooler in the truck and would pull stuff out of it and take it back to the cabin and put it in the fridge there. So it wasn't like you were toting a heavy cooler around everywhere you went. Um, yeah, and I like it because if you've been enjoying your time, maybe on the beach... Or on the river. Or on the river, and, you know, you're a little tipsy when you come in to cook dinner for everybody. Voila. Five <laughs> minutes is ready, huh? Five minutes is ready. That's why you like it. <laughs> you're not in there having to do all the prep and cooking and all that stuff for an hour or whatever. Heck, yeah. Nobody wants to do that. I get it. But, uh, so let's talk about reheating barbecue. All right. What What's your favorite way? I don't know. Right. How do you reheat barbecue? So I would think, I mean, the best, of course, the best way is don't reheat it, eat it fresh. But that's not always the case. If you've got a small family, you're cooking a whole bud or something, you got to reheat something. It's best to store it in as large of chunks or muscles as you can. I've always said that. 
So, like, if I'm putting up uh, meat, pulled pork, I will muscle it out, pull enough that we're going to eat for a meal, and the rest of it's either going in a – I like to vacuum seal it. That is the absolute best way. Uh, it could keep in the refrigerator for four to five days vacuum sealed. So we're or, talking about pulled pork specifically. Yeah, yeah, pulled okay. pork specifically. And to reheat it, all you do is heat up some water and just get it boiling and then cut it off and then drop it down in there and just let it hang out. If it's vacuum sealed. If it's vacuum sealed. If it's vacuum sealed. That's the easiest way. Now, if you got the sous vide, which those things are cheap now, you can buy one of those on Amazon for 100 bucks or maybe even cheaper, and it'll control the temp. Like you set it on 140, and you can drop your bags right in there and just reheat it in that, and you can do a bunch. Like we did it in a – it mounted on the side of one of our little uh, double stack co- – or party stacker coolers mount the sous vide on the side of it with a little thumb screw thing and put water in it and put the meat in there and it'll hold it all day same you all it's it's ready to go that's the best way now can you reheat it in the oven yeah i've done it plenty of times you can dump I it throw out. the whole vacuum seal bag in a pan in the oven and reheat it in the vacuum seal bag now i don't know if you get i don't know the legality of that but <laughs> i mean it does it works it blows it. up you think of roasting bag it blows up it holds it it doesn't like melt the plastic. I yeah. guess it could, now I wouldn't put it right on the heat element. You got to have it in another pan or something. And I don't put it too high. Yeah. I do like 300. Yeah. And just reheat it that way. Yeah. That's one way to do it. It takes a while. It does take like an hour. I've yeah. even done it in the microwave shell. Oh, yeah. Just zap it. But I don't like put it on there and put it on five minutes. I don't feel I like do that. like intervals at a time, rotate it, intervals at a time in the bag. Yeah. It, you've got to rotate it, it. And it brings it right back too. Because to me, in the microwave, it doesn't get evenly heated. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it don't. If you don't move it around or if you just put it on three minutes and let it go, I don't even care if it's carousel and it's not going to get heated as good. But a little – Mike Mills just call it radar love. <laughs> they, they, could, they, could, they, could re, they could give some stuff some radar love and get it right back to ready. Yeah. If you know how to use that tool, it'll work. The um, best way, though, is the water method, I think. That's the best way. What's the time on the water method? I mean, time to boil the water – or get the water hot is the main thing. Like reheating time. I mean, 20, 30 minutes is good to go. Done it in a crock pot, too. You know, put the meat, yeah, put the bag in the crock pot. It, well, it takes longer for a crock pot to heat up. Yeah. But I've done it in it. Um, done it on the grill. Sometimes you got to reheat it on the grill. And I would just, for that, I usually would put it in an aluminum pan, put the meat in there. You can leave it in the bag or take it out of the bag, put foil over that, and stick it back on your pit and let the pit warm it up. And it's going to take, you know, you want to keep it 250, 275. And, let it slowly heat up. But the key is to serve it, you've got to get it back to 140 degrees. That's the recommended serving temperature on like pulled pork or something like that. Yeah. So follow those food safety guidelines. I disagree. I don't like to put up, uh, when I put it up, I don't like to put it up in big chunks. I like you like to, to go ahead and pull it? I like to go ahead and pull it. I go ahead and season it, sauce it. If we're talking pulled pork. Oh, you're doctored already. I'm doctoring it right there. And then I'm going to package it up so it's ready to go as soon as I cut it out yeah. of the bag. So you're adding the juice to it and the flavor. Because I like to keep it whole because it keeps more moisture inside it. That's is my thinking. That's really a good point. Yeah. And then you pull it out and you pull it then. Yep. Does it not take longer to get warm in larger chunks? Uh, Yeah, because it's denser. Yeah. It takes a little bit longer. Now, you, yeah, because you're pulled stuff, it, you can have it in seconds mm-hmm. back ready to go. It doesn't take long at all. Yeah, I guess you you do lose a little moisture if you're doing that. Goes that goes for like pulled chicken and stuff like that too. You can do it the same way. What now, about when I do turkeys? I always vacuum seal them up whole and reheat them whole, and that way you can slice. When you them mean and stuff. turkeys, you mean like if I was doing whole turkeys and a whole we, turkey know, when we vacuum seal them, yeah. use those expandable bags, put it in a metal pan like a half pan, put the expandable, put it inside the expandable bag, and then suck it tight. It'll pull all the air out of that and hold uh. the turkey. Chickens, it'll cool do the same it thing. completely before you. You always got to cool. You got to let it sit there and cool. Yeah, for all, everything, don't you? Yeah. yeah. What happens if you don't? It, it's not going to seal. It's not going to pull down as much. It's going to as it cools. It's going to create pockets in there. But I guess what that warm stuff has still got steam coming off mm-hmm. of it, so it's working against the the bag. And that's why it does it. it but it's always it. best to let it cool down. I mean, don't don't seal it straight off the grill for sure, but let it sit there for you know a good 30, 45 minutes and rest. When you vacuum seal them turkeys, the pan you got that turkey in, uh, a lot of times it'll, it'll suck it up. I mean, it's, <laughs> it gets all the air out of it. But man, it makes it for reheating a turkey. How do you? It's just as turkey? juicy. 
I, I do take that one out of the bag and reheat it. I'll, I'll open it up, uh, put it in a new pan. I usually pour a little bit of the juice when, I'm, when I've cooked it in that pan so there's some moisture that I can add back to the pan to I'm gonna warm it up in and then pop it in the oven with foil over it and then watch it. It usually takes, depending on like the size of the turkey, it's it could be anywhere from hour and 45 minutes to two and a half hours reheated, you know, not not super long, not like 350, like 300. Yeah. But you just want to get it back to 140 degrees and it's dense, so it takes a little bit. What about ribs? Um, I, I've never tried the sous vide method on ribs. I don't see why it wouldn't work. It's just normally if I'll do ribs, I'll wrap them up in plastic wrap and then wrap them in aluminum foil and then put them up. And that way, when you reheat them, you can just reheat them right in the foil and the plastic wrap keeps everything nice and tight. You get all the juice that stays in there. And then when you, cause it's not going to melt either. And I just pop them on a sheet pan or either on the grill about three, three twenty five, and let them heat up. Usually 45 minutes they're good to go ready to serve you can unwrap them and if you want to reglaze them or re-get them pretty again put a little rub on them or something you could do that too right at the end just opened up for a few minutes um exposed to the heat and the air and that'll work too but ribs do really well like that plastic wrap and then aluminum foil most of the people i know that own barbecue restaurants use so much plastic wrap yeah, when they're they you do. Know, storing yeah. and serving and catering and all that and it doesn't melt, right? No, it's it's it could take the heat. Yeah. I don't know what it would do at you know five hundred degrees, yeah. but it's not you're not heating it at that hot. We're not you know. Um, re so ribs you can reheat them on the smoker too. Yeah, same way. Just exactly put them put them straight back in the full wrap on there, and heat them up, and then uncover them. You can reglaze them right on the grill. That's an easy way. You can char uh, char glaze them. That's what I like. That's one way I like to do it too. Because I like say if you had a grill, and you could two zone fire it. Have your grills warming up on the side, and then when they get good and hot, over on the direct heat side, take them out of that foil and put them, you know, put them over there, heat them up, spread some sauce on them, throw them meat side down, the sauce on the back, flip them back and forth, and they're ready to go. And that's a, a good char glazed ribs, really good like that. If you're reheating a lot of ribs, I'd say that's the way that's why like you got these rib fest or these big rib. That's a lot of times that's what they're doing. Oh, yeah. They'll have cooked all these uh, hundreds and hundreds or thousands of pounds of ribs. And they've got those big event char griller grills with maybe grill grates or something on them. And they're just putting them on there, mopping them with a good sauce, turning them, mopping them with the sauce, and then going to the cut table. That's how they're reheating them. And they work, it works great like that. Yeah, you get you can reheat, sparkle flavor. You can too. reheat them out of the foil. You just don't want to put that sauce on there too soon. Like, you know, because it's going to, the sauce is going to caramelize real quick over direct heat. So if you've got a saucy rib or a real sweet rub already on it, just know that the time you give it exposed to direct heat is more chance it's going to burn. So you want to watch that. That's why I like leaving them in the foil off to the side and the in the cool zone, slowly coming up. And then if you want to at the end, you might char glaze them. Char them. Yep, yeah. Yep. Uh, There's remember, something about that flavor that's good. I know, know it is good. Um, I remember one year at Memphis MA, uh, we had to serve lunch for a group of people. You know, we were catering lunch, yeah, yeah. and we didn't have time to cook all the ribs, so we cooked them the day before, wrapped them up, cooled them down, put them on the... It, it, anyway, the next morning we came in and was putting them on the the pit to warm them up, mm -hmm. and I remember the local TV station came by. I was like, y'all got meat on the grill this early? L let's get let, let's get some footage. And they were getting this footage, and you were like, that stuff's stone cold. <laughs> they were thinking it was, thinking it was all freshly yeah. cooked stuff. I remember that. And you were just sitting there talking about it. Yeah, we got I, these ribs on it. 4 a.m. We've been up early cooking. You got to give them a tail now. That's what it's all about. Especially down at Memphis and May. Yeah. You know how much stuff gets cooked like that and reserved at those lunches? You couldn't get out there and feed 150 people ribs at, you know, getting up that morning and cook them. I imagine most catering stuff is reheated. Yeah, yeah a lot of reheating. Yeah. Barbecue is one of those things. But so, I mean, it reheats pretty well. Yeah. Uh, some, I mean, it's never as good. Like, re, I could, I can tell. I can tell when I go to a restaurant and they, this you? is the day befores or, you know, even, especially with like with ribs, they don't have a lot of holding power. You know, a couple hours, that's about all you're going to get out of them. And then that's one of the freshest. And then reheated rib, I don't care what you say, it's still going to dry out some. It just it has to. That's just how they are. Uh, pulled pork, you can get away with it a little more. But if you've, you, you know how good pulled pork is coming off the pit after yeah. it's rested a little bit and you glazed it. 
and you're breaking it apart. There has never been a piece of reheated pork that's as good as taking a bite of it that first time you pull it out. You know, there's never. I don't care what you say. You can taste it. It's like, I don't know if it's the fat or, you know, the rendered juices out of the meat. Once you cool them back down, they just never get back there to that initial flavor that they had. I mean, it, it changes. The flavor changes when that pork, I guess it's the pork juices cool and reheating them. It's not the same flavor. So, and I don't even think brisket is either. I mean, briskets. Yeah. How do you oh, reheat brisket? We didn't same way. That. Same, same way. way. You reheat it all the same way. It's just how long does it take to get it to the warm temp? Yeah. But I mean, you could reheat a brisket. I mean, is it good sliced and reheated? Not as good as if you keep it whole, reheat it, and then slice it. Um, but I mean, just however you easy. If you don't want to, you want to you reheat it fast. It's faster when it's sliced, pre-sliced, and in a vacuum sealed bag. But the one key thing to take away from this is that vacuum sealer is is the makes key. it key. And I don't care if it's a cheap food saver one or if you got a West or one of the expensive chamber vacs, the vacuum sealer really, really does work. You, We've had the expensive I'm, ones. We've I'll had bet the, there are a bunch of them. Yeah. They all tear up. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I mean. Your favorite one's like a $50, $60 one you keep down at camp. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's not even mine. That's one Mark just brought down there yeah. we're just using. But the reason why, so the one I had, I bought it at Sam's. And it's the older model food saver where you have to line up the edge and put it through the little groove. Well, the newer model one, or I don't know what model one that is that Mark has, it just has like a garage door. And you have to, like, you put your bag up there. There's no guiding it, getting it lined up. You stick it in, slam that door shut, and lock it down. And that's so easy to me, and just let it churn. Now, the they're great for just doing stuff at the house. If you're trying to get a operation going where you got to seal multiple stuff, bag after bag after bag after bag, they're going to overheat. And that's what we've ran into. We've been running three or four of them, just overheating them uh, because you're sealing so much. If you're sealing, you know, 300 bags of stuff, you're going to overheat them. But if you're just doing a pork butt or a turkey or something like that, it's not bad. Not yeah. bad at all on it. Yeah, for home use. Yeah. So do you have to do anything special before or during the cook if you know that you're Gonna to warm reheat. it up later. Yeah. I, I mean, a lot of times I won't glaze if I'm going to know that I'm going to reheat it and serve it. I will cook it to where it's done, rested, everything you got to do to it, but I won't put it back on the pit and glaze it like ribs, pork butt, even a, a brisket. If I was going to glaze a brisket, I would. I'd wait and do it when I warmed it up. That way, I can. It's going to be fresher tasting. If I put the if I warm it up and then put it back on the grill and then glaze it or char grill it or however you want to do it, it's gonna it's gonna make it seem like it's a lot fresher than it is by waiting. Now if you seal it up with all those sauces and all that, if you heat it back too much and you got the heat too high, it's gonna burn. I just think you get better flavor and better product by waiting to put the sauce or anything to it. But do, have you? That's ever- why. Uh, that's why. Like if you buy Corky's ribs. Or anybody's ribs, they send you sauce with it to reheat and then put it on and yeah. set that. It's because it kind of brings it back some. Yeah, every one that we've ever ordered or gotten yeah, in the mail. It's been like that. Yeah, yeah, you basically glaze it yourself at mm-hmm. home in the reheat process. Have you ever seen anybody like cook it halfway? Because we always get that question. <sighs> no, I would not do that. You're setting yourself up for, too, for food being in the danger zone too long. Yeah. I mean, like, say if you cooked a turkey halfway. And pulled it out. Then you got to let it cool. Well, it's not even up to temp long enough to kill all the bacteria in it. And then you're going to refrigerate or freeze it. Then you're going to thaw it or transport it back. And then you're going to try to reheat it. You're doing too many, too much risk there. I would fully cook it, let it cool to a proper temperature to vacuum seal it, and then put it up. That's the best way to do it. Now, I usually, I mean, like I said, I don't vacuum seal the ribs. That's the one thing that I do plastic wrap just because of the shape of them. But everything else, I try to vacuum seal. Oh, that vacuum seal. Key. Maybe we need to try that. Vacuum seal some whole ribs and see how to reheat them. I'd be good. Do a test. couple different methods and yeah, see, what's see which the one's best. the best. See which one reheats the best. That'd be a good little trial. Yeah. Same thing with pulled pork. Yeah, we could I mean, do the same thing and brisket. Some test. To me, brisket's the hardest out of all those. It just dries out so easily. Yeah, it does. That's why I say I don't like to slice the brisket. Yeah. Before I 
get ready to serve it. We've done that before. Yep. And it does make it easier when you go to serve it. Yeah. But it, it definitely does, but I think it you lose so much of the when when you reheat it, you lose all the moisture and the pieces are dry. You always have to add like more beef broth or some kind of brisket mop or something to, to get your flavor back because it's just not the same. Those pieces want to dry out. And once that moisture is it good? Really eh, it's pretty good. <laughs> but it ain't the absolute best. So I got um we got a little time left, so I got some questions from the community. I love Almost questions. Spit fire them to you. All right. Can I do a rump roast like a brisket and pull it apart for pulled beef? What's a rump roast? I, I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of roast in the rump. I'd have to know more. I mean. Oh, okay. So that's what, too general. Can yeah. I just do a roast? How about a beef roast? Yeah. So I don't see why not. Like just a top a sirloin roast or something like that. Back end of cow roast. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you cook it till it falls apart? Yes. But I would not use a rump roast. I'd use a chuck roast. That's going to be your closest thing to brisket. If you cook a roast like that, I've always, the way we've done them, like a top sirloin roast or some of those larger muscles like out of the hind quarter mm -hmm. is sear them, hard working muscles. sear them, and then cook them rare, and then make sure you slice them against the grain and you know slice thin. Makes excellent, like, uh, Roast beef, and like you would get, yeah, yeah, but but cooking it until it's fall apart to make pulled meat, it's just not that good. It's just there's no fat to it, so it don't. It's just stringy, stringy meat, you okay. know. Get you a chuck roast instead. Yeah, get you something with some fat and some marbling in it. And do it, you know. That's gonna make way better if you're trying to get like brisket, like pulled beef. Now some of those those uh, roasts they use in like pit beef. But they're constantly slicing it off and cooking it more rare, and it's more about getting the grill flavor on it and stuff than it is like cooking it well done to where it shreds. So I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying I don't think it would be that good if you cooked it till it was, you know, pullable or choppable. Um. So brisket turned out tasting like pot roast any tips or suggestions uh yeah change your rubs up change your smoke up what do you uh, mean change your smoke up what does that mean like smoke it longer okay uh, make sure you smoked it till it got to about 170 175 um i would i would say it probably got wrapped real early and it might have been even cooked on a pellet grill yeah if you're getting that flavor pellet grill yeah so you they need said... longer lower temps in on a pellet grill to turn out like Texas style brisket, you know, the brisket that he's probably wanting, keep those temps low, smoke it overnight. And then when it gets, you can even wait till it's, you know, 185, 190 on a pellet grill to wrap and then let it finish to like 202 right in that area till it's soft, wrap it towards the end and then rest it. It's going to be the best. It's not going to taste like pot roast, but it, you're not getting like, if you've got that pellet grill running 250 or above, you're not going to get much smoke on it at all, especially. Smoked you know, at 250. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you're not going to get much smoke flavor at all doing that on it. I, I would say you, it, it, and you can also overcome that time. Like some people say they may not have time to do it. Well, started out low, those critical stages where that brisket's making bark, where it's soaking up smoke flavor, then let it come up slow to 160, 165, then wrap it, then crank it up and go past 250, go 275, 300 to finish it. Once it's wrapped, you don't care, but it's about that initial stage of setting that bark uh, getting that smoke, you know, down in the brisket. You can only do that at lower temps on a pellet grill. And maybe even change your pellets up. Make sure you're using like some a, a good hardwood blend. Don't use the fruit woods on a on a brisket. You know, go for pecan, go for hickory, go for some oak. Uh, you know, if you can get any, use those kinds of woods on your brisket on a pellet grill. You have done a brisket with the intention of making it be have pot roast yeah 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 i mean that's i, I have it's i did yeah. it for easter one year on a recipe i did it with the vegetables and all that Serve that's a good brisket to me yeah but i know it's if you're wanting you're yeah, if you're wanting, wanting texas brisket you know or what you think ideally barbecue brisket i should call it is is more that heavy bark smoke you know the big nice slices yeah bark all around it that's probably yeah, what he's yeah. wanting when you said that i was i, I either knew they wrapped it early or they it let it go to on 60, 165 is what they said before yeah. they wrapped it. So. But it was the temp probably did it to it. Yeah. It probably got to 165 pretty quick on a pellet grill. I mean, 
at you're talking four or five hours depending on how big it was or i like to go you know before i wrap when i'm doing that overnight or that brisket's going 12 hours at 200 and just sitting there smoking and just sitting there smoking yeah yeah, yeah. absorbing it going slow then when you wrap it, it you know it's already got that meteorite look. And then you're just finishing it at the end, just rendering you're the just stuff. You're tendering. It. Yep, getting it tender. And then let it rest. And then let it rest at minimum two hours. Four to six is better. And it makes it delicious, melting your mouth. <laughs> it's been a while since you cooked a brisket. It has. I need to cook one. Well, my- I looked at one the other day. I got caught looking at one. I was at Sam's Club buying some butts, so I got to cook a case of butts this weekend for a buddy of mine. And uh, this guy kept looking at me, and he got his phone out, and he was slick taking a picture of me <laughs> at Sam's at the meat counter. And I was looking at this big brisket, you know. I was, but the pack, I was going to buy it. I, like, picked it up and was examining it, but the cryovac was broke. And then I got this dude down there taking pictures of me. <laughs> and, and so he finally made eye contact, and I just smiled at him or whatever. And he said, you think about cooking a brisket? I was like, yeah, I might, you know. I said, I don't really see any I like. And so he had to come over and talk to me and tell me all the stuff. It happens. <laughs> but he was smooth. Like, a bit. I was like, man, is this the undercover Sam's guy? Like, does he think <laughs> I'm fixing to try to steal this brisket or something? I'm just looking at Shove it. Shove it you down know? your pants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't have any pork butts out. And luckily. You said Sam's was. Man, it I don't know. It, I don't know what it was. People must be just cooking because the meat department was wiped out. They were they were stocking it because I because I caught the butcher back there, and luckily, the butcher recognized me. And he's like, "Hey, man, ain't you the YouTube guy?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'll do some videos." I said, "Y'all got any butts?" He said, I, "Let me see." And so I, I got. He brought out a couple cases. And I got to pick which one I wanted. So oh, that's good. That's a perk. Of being on YouTube. <laughs> Sometimes you get recognized. <laughs> In a good way. In a good way, yeah. And it gets you nice butts. So shout out to Sam's and the butchers there. Uh, the butts that you put in the fridge for cooking this weekend looked really yeah, good. Yeah, they looked really good. They all yeah. looked all uniform. Because sometimes you get that pack and you get a little bitty baby butt yep. and a big old monster butt. So we got to do that Saturday. Oh, I forgot about that. A load of butts. What are you going to cook them on? Uh, you know, since I got to cook. A whole case of them. I may crank up the old hickory. I think so, too. Last it time just, we cooked on the old hickory, cooked a bunch of butts on the old <clears> hickory. They were oh, fire. delicious. It's a set and forget. It's as easy as old Ronco. <laughs> For real. You crank that dude up, load it up with charcoal, put you some wood on it, and then it's got the gas assist on the CTO. So once you get them through the smoke stage, you can just let that dude ride over. and It'll hold that pit wherever you want it. I can, I can get you know 12-hour butts, low and slow, no wrap. And they're good to go. I mean, they got a bark on them, and they're melting your mouth. They're really good. I think that's what you should do. That's what I'm planning. That's what yeah. the plan is. Let them ride. What do you do? Rub them down? Just rub, rub them, them and run them. That's why I rub them and run them. You don't baste them? You don't wrap them? You don't? Nope. Don't do nothing. Just let the smoke get them. Get them in there. You know, sp- spread them out to where, I mean, that's the key. A lot of people, they want to cook a bunch of meat. But you got to always cook it to your grill because you can't just pack it full. It's going to, for one, there's no airflow moving, so you're stopping the grill up. And then things aren't cooking even. It's going to take longer. You got to kind of, you know, space it out. Make sure air can flow all around. So when I put eight butts on this pit, well, it, I'll have them, you know, scattered around the grill. and It's like it'll hold 24, no problem. Yeah. So eight's a good load on it. Cooks, it cooks a case. As good as any grill out there because it's got the best airflow and they cook even rack to rack. And, and they baste each other. I mean, you can get them to where they're dripping on each other and it's just. And you can phenomenal. go to sleep and late. You can go to sleep and, to, and just hope the power don't go out. <laughs> With our luck, the storms we've been having. I thought I'd lost everything last week. Yeah. Our power went out last Friday. Did not come back on till Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. It was like 5 o'clock on Friday evening. At two o'clock on Sunday. The only thing we lost was stuff in the refrigerator. The freezers, I didn't open. I knew whatever you do, don't open them yeah. and we'll assess. And so by that second day, I was like, ah, it's going to be close. And sure enough, uh, there were some popsicles that were like a little soft. It's the only <laughs> thing I lost in the freezer. I got lucky on that. Like juice bars are starting to soften. Because you got two freezers full of meat. It's three. You think about the half freezer on bottom and then the deep freeze and then the beer fridge up top where I got a lot of my meat. Yeah. Uh, I was I was I was like, Shell, this could be 
catastrophic. I was. Looking, if I, I'd have cried if I'd have lost thousands of dollars of meat like that. I was looking at my chops. I was like, we're I mean, going to clean it out. I got some of the most expensive <laughs> meat in the world in there. There's deer and duck. You know how much that stuff costs me to get the money we spend getting that? That's true. That's true. <laughs> I've got some snapper. I've got some grouper in there. God, let's cook been, it. I need to. Sometimes I like collecting. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's time to go through the freezer. That was a, that was the only bright side to the power outage and losing that stuff is you get to start over. Yeah, that's how I was that like. That means more hunting, more fishing, more going to the store. So, there anyway. was some uh, really good beef in there. I would have been upset about <clears throat> losing, but oh, everything yeah. else, a good purge wouldn't have hurt. Good <laughs> And I keep having to stop you from buying more stuff to go in there. You never know when something's going to happen. See, that's what gives you that you think. You're prepping up to have all this stuff in case something happens. You lose power and it's all gone. You can't do nothing with it anyway. Yeah. So. yeah. Better learn to hunt and fish. That's all I got to say. Raise <laughs> animals. <laughs> well, Mount, that's all I have for all today. Right. <laughs> it's been fun. Um, we don't have Tyler here, so y'all check out the How to Barbecue Your Right community. That's where a group of all of us like-minded barbecue people hang out and talk about barbecue, answer questions. So if y'all have any questions or you're sending me comments and stuff, make sure you post them on that community because chances are we might answer them here on the podcast, might see them on that community as I try to jump in there. But also other people that know more than I do will jump on there and answer them too. So that's a great place to and start. And we're starting a, com- uh, a giveaway today. <clears throat> what is the giveaway? It's a July 4th giveaway. All you got to do is vote on which rib recipe you like the best, and 10 people are going to win a prize pack of rubs and sauces and a hat. What was our goal to eventually get everybody a winner? Yeah. <laughs> we're going to keep giving away stuff till everybody's a winner. So it's, y'all just hang yeah, in there. All you got to do is go in there and Are y'all say, tracking, like, can you win twice? Like, if you win this month, can you win the next month? I don't know. I don't think yeah, we're keeping up with it. Y'all better start thinking about that. Yeah. What if you get some ringers? Like them people that work the call-in radio shows, and they're the prize pack winners. <laughs> we need to. Like, yeah, you need to like you need to figure out a way to eliminate. I don't even know how y'all pick, but anyway, it's a great place, and we're giving away <laughs> cool stuff. Hey, and the Palmer Home thing started. Yes, we're giving away an Outlaw Grill this year. Yeah, and I don't a even know lesson. how. Yeah. Oh, and a free cooking lesson too. And a, and a ha- learn how to cook on the grill. Lesson. Do you get a trip to the smokehouse? Or are we doing that at the? Because that's going to be totally. Like, I don't know what that would be worth. Like, if you got to come to the new smokehouse. And learn how to cook on the pit. And learn how to cook on the, the outlaw. That's the only th- kicker with the outlaw. you got to come get it. There's no shipping involved Yeah, in yeah. You can pick it up at the factory or you can come to Hernando and learn to cook on it with us. So, yeah, that's fun. Yeah, we'll be um, sharing those details as soon as that goes live. Yeah. Is it live? It goes t- live today, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Shell, tell them where they can find us. If you'd like to connect with. Malcolm, it's How To BBQ Right on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and of course YouTube. If you'd like to connect with me, it's Miss Southern Show on Instagram. We will see y'all next time. Y'all have a good weekend. We gone.